important thing. And uh, we're looking at a section that's quite often quoted. Preach the word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. One of the words that comes up in the first verse there is therefore. So they, they always, did I say first, 2 Timothy? Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Um, one of the things they always tell you, when you in the Bible when you see therefore or wherefore, you know, look and see what it's there for. And uh, he's been saying in chapter 3, we're in perilous times. Uh, later on in the chapter he said it's, it's going to get worse, but you're prepared. You know, Paul talking to Timothy and God talking to us. Uh, God has given us what we need to face the day that we live in. And uh, so then he says, I charge thee therefore. And then he gets on down in, preach the word. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let me read verses 1 through 5. That's what we're going to cover tonight. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, keep to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. We just stop reading there. Boy, there's a lot in this, this portion of Scripture. I'm going to give you nine things tonight. And uh, you know me, it won't take us long. But uh, nine areas that this, this verses, these verses talk about. And, and the first one there in verse 1 basically is remember your calling. Remember who you are. He says, I charge thee. Uh, those words charge means I solemnly witness. This is a very solemn uh, statement that, that he's making. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's not, the, the way that's structured is he's talking about one person. It's like if I, I was talking to my nephew and I said, uh, your father and my brother. Same person. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he uses that word before, it means in his presence. <clears throat> yeah, we're, uh, we have a present tense relationship with God. It's not just something that's going to come down the track. And it sounds like that. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom? Uh, we have a relationship with God now. You know, it's not just in the future. Uh, so he's saying, remember your calling. Uh, you have a relationship to God. And there's, it's a good study. I'd encourage you to do it. To go through the New Testament, look all the, at all the verses that talk about our calling. Um, for instance, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter... 1 and, and verse 26, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He's talking about, yeah, God's called us. He's called us to salvation. He's called us to service. Uh, we have a calling of God. Uh, later on in, in chapter 2, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, he says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, we have a relationship with the Lord, and, and our, our job is to, to live for Jesus, to live Him uh, before the world. There's another verse I wanted to share, 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12. That ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you into His kingdom and glory. There's another verse that talks about His calling. He's called us into His kingdom and His glory. Uh, we're part of God's kingdom. And uh, we need to remember our calling. We, we represent the Lord. You know, when, when you're going around in, in your life, you're a child of the King. <laughs> Keep that in mind. And we're there to glorify God. What, whatever we do is to, to be done for the glory of God. You know, Jesus is coming, and he, He's talking about that there in in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, he, he will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. But Jesus is also here. <laughs> He's not just coming. He, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. <laughs> you know, I, God's not dead. I talked to him this morning. There's, there's lots of cliches we can use, but we know the living Savior. Uh, remember your calling. And when he says, I charge thee, he's saying, this is, this is important. 
You have a relationship with the Lord. He's going to judge you, but you're representing him to this world that is going to be judged as well. They need a chance. They need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We represent the Lord. And then his charge is preach the word. So number one, remember your calling. Number two, preach the word. That means to herald, to speak with authority. You don't often hear people doing that, but sometimes out in public you'll hear somebody, they really raise their voice and, and let her rip, you know. Uh, maybe they're selling something or maybe they're street preaching or, you know, whatever. I don't have a real good voice for that, but, you know, some guys can really do that. It's like they got a built-in uh, microphone, you know, <laughs> amplifier. And uh, he's saying, let it go. Get it out there. And when he says preach the word, this is it. <laughs> you know, it's not just bits and pieces of it. The, the whole thing is, is God's word. Back in chapter 3, verse 16, he talks about all scripture. Yeah, that's what we're, what we're preaching he keeps coming back to that theme in 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, he says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. It's, it's the word. In uh, chapter 2, verse 15, famous verse, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then, of course, 3.15, how he, he said, You've known the Holy Scriptures from a child. We need to, to preach the world, the, the word. Get that right. I'm looking at my notes, and my next point is, today there are many worldly churches. And the reason is, they're not preaching the word. You know, a lot of groups that uh, are kind of like churches, uh, they're, they're not in, in the church business. They're not preaching the word. Uh, they're in the marketing business. Boy, some of them are expert marketers. Uh, they've got a product, and man, they're, they're flogging it for all they're worth. Some are in the entertainment business. And they, they, some of them are pretty good. You know, they go on Australian Idol, and they win. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the guys that won Australian Idol, the, the preacher that church he came from, said he's not even our best singer. <laughs> uh, you know, some of them are in the, in the entertainment business. And, you know, when we do things, we're, we're not here to entertain, but when we sing, we, we should do our best. And uh, when we try to reach out and let people know we're here, we should, we should do our best. So the problem is, because churches don't preach the, the Bible, what they're doing is they're making people comfortable in their materialism and in their self-love. Yeah, our world is built on materialism. Liking yourself and, and being happy and having everything you need. There, there's churches that will preach that if you'll, if you'll do what they say, you'll have, a, you'll have a Mercedes. You'll have a limo, you know. I, I'm not sure how that gets you to heaven because... Uh, I mean, it can't even get you to an island very far off the coast, you know, let alone heaven. But, uh, you know, we're not trying to make people comfortable. We're trying to preach the word. And sometimes that'll comfort our soul. And we had the, the funeral Friday, and, and I shared with them, you know, if you know the Lord, there's comfort. But there's also responsibility. There's also accountability. Uh, where are we as a church? Uh, we need to, to often stop and, and think about that. How do we view success? You know, is it if all the chairs are full or, you know, if people like us? Um, uh, we need to be careful because our calling, part of our calling is to, to preach the word. And if we're not doing that, we're, we're not doing what God has called us to do. Now, the world will often disagree with what God says. I know who, whose side I want to be on in that argument. <laughs> uh, we need to remember our calling. We need to preach the word. And then thirdly, we need to be faithful. Verse 2, he says, be instant in season, out of season. Now, we're, we're used to, in this modern age, instant. It means it's ready. You know, you turn on the TV, it's ready. You've got instant hot water. You know, you don't have to wait for the kettle to boil. It's there. That's what he says we should be as Christians. And he says we should be ready in season, out of season. All that means is when it's easy and when it's hard. When when you're expecting it, when you're not expecting it. Uh, opportune times. Uh, the word auspicious came to my mind the other day. I had a, I've had a couple of auspicious things happen lately. That means it was, it was something that was worked out well. Um, on Tuesdays, I normally go out door knocking. So I come into the church, and I'm here at the building, and then I, I go out. And, uh, I was, then that day, I was expecting someone to come and repair the copier. They didn't call, they didn't call. So finally about 1.30, I went down, and they were in here fixing the copier. 
I said, how'd you get in here? Well, the door was open. That's an auspicious occasion. <laughs> it worked out well. They weren't burglars. <laughs> they were fixing our cop here. That was good. I was glad about that. Um, you know, that was in season. That, that worked out well. Um, the funeral Friday. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing how uh, to, to talk to people. Most of those people I didn't know. We knew Thelma and I, I knew some of the, the daughters and that. But uh, as the, they came here after the funeral, we had the chairs all set up and had some food and, and so on. And I and got, eventually got to talk to some of the different ones. And I sat next to one man. I learned his name was Mr. Dixon. And uh, he, he said to me, almost one of the first things he said to me, what is this about being born again? That is in season. <laughs> that is an auspicious occasion. <laughs> and so I had the chance to just share with him what that is, how we're, we're dead and trespasses and sin. God gives us life. I don't have to tell you the whole story there, but, uh, you know, there, sometimes it's, you get an opportunity and think, boy, this is a, this is a good chance, you know, to, to do something for the Lord. And uh, you think, well, this is almost, am I on candid camera? You know, kind of, so you young people don't know what that is, but anyway. Uh, but other times, you think, man, how did I get in this situation? It's out of season. You know, you go to talk to somebody, and I've had times when I go door knock. I remember one time, I was at the street, and I started to go up the footpath, and this lady started yelling at me. Get out of here! We don't want <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's kind of out of season. Uh, sometimes it's hard. Paul got to get thrown in prison to, to witness. I don't know if that's in season or out of season, but, you know, can you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul? <laughs> you, you, can you imagine what you would be talking about? <laughs> I, I don't think he, he let that stop him. Anyway, I, I don't want to go on too long about that, but we need to use the opportunities God gives us. Sometimes you'll have an in season. Sometimes you'll have an out of season. And sometimes if you'll bear through it, uh, it it'll, it'll turn out. Because you'll, you'll find this, people who are under conviction from the Holy Spirit are, get kind of mean. If, you're, if you have someone in your own home, especially, you know, husband or wife that's you know, under conviction from the Holy Spirit, it can be hard to live with because God's poking them. Uh, it's, it's, some of you have gone through that in, in times past. Uh, but we just need to, to be in season, out of season. Take the opportunities that are there. I think I might have read this, this verse this morning, 1 Corinthians 16, 9. Just, just listen to it. He said, a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. I'm sure I read that this morning, but he's saying, here's an opportunity, but it's, it's going to be tough. Someone said, the door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes you've got to push through. But when there's a door, when God gives you an opportunity, uh, take advantage of, of the opportunity to, to witness and to, to preach the word, to share it with people. You know, we, we don't need more programs. We don't need better programs. We just need to, to be the people that God wants us to be and, and take the opportunities to witness to people. That, that's the theme this year. I mentioned it this morning. You know, holding forth the word of life. It, it does, that's not a program we're trying to do. We're just trying as people to be better witnesses for the Lord. To let our light shine. Uh, shine as lights in the world. And, and, and to do what Jesus said. Uh, really, personal soul winning is an attitude, isn't it? Uh, we just see that these are, those are lost folks out there, and uh, the Lord loves them. So we need to be faithful. Then he, he says in that same verse, this is the fourth thing, reprove, rebuke, exhort. We'll cover those three as one. Uh, sometimes as Christians, we, we have to do like the Lord says here. We have to reprove people. Now, from what I can understand in studying these words, reproving and rebuking, Part of the difference is how the person responds. When you reprove someone, they get under conviction. Quite often when you rebuke someone, that's, that's a stern warning. Uh, sometimes they don't listen, but still we're responsible to stand for what's right. That doesn't mean we're, we're mean or anything like that, but uh, there's just a time when you have to say, no, this is wrong. You are wrong to do this. It's kind of the situation we're facing here with homosexuals and homosexual marriage. Listen, we, we don't hate homosexuals, but God hates their sin, and it's, it's hurting them more than any, anyone else. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to rebuke, and we speak the truth in love, and we do it for, 
for their good and for their welfare. And, and the, the positive word there is exhort. The first two are kind of negative, aren't they? Reprove, rebuke. Exhort is to beg or beseech. Same word is used in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. I, I beg you. Really what he's saying, this will help you. Please do it. And uh, we need to speak the truth in love. Someone has said we need to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's a good statement. And he says to do it with long suffering. This is not something we just do once or, or just do on the occasion. Uh, we need to keep at it patiently. And he says to do it, are you looking there in, in the end of verse 2? With all long suffering and doctrine. Now, this is not our opinion that we're supposed to be sharing. This doctrine means teaching. We have the authority of the Bible. Uh, I was really refreshed to hear a, a preacher on a talk show. It's been a couple of years ago. I was just looking at it on YouTube. And they were talking about homosexual marriage. And he would just take the scriptures and say, well, this is... It was just really refreshing. You know, he didn't try and make the, the logic of this or that. Or, he just said, here's what, here's what God says. And one of the men was a homosexual and said, well, I never... Anyway, he said, let me just speak to you personally. And he just, just very kindly shared with him, you know, the, the love of God. And it was a blessing uh, to hear. He did it with doctrine. And he spoke the truth in love. A true preaching is the explanation and application of Bible doctrine. And that's a, that's a good thing. So, uh, he's saying, remember your calling. Preach the word. Be faithful. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. And then in verses 3 and 4, he's more or less saying here, don't compromise. These, these are odd verses, really. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, it's not the teachers who have itching ears. It's the people, they, we use an expression, that, 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 tickling their ears. Is that an expression still? You know, it means we want people to say what we want to hear. That's the kind of teachers people want. People that make them feel good. And it says, they, verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. They, they'd rather hear stories than the truth. And, you know, we're... Life goes in cycles, you know, this, this comes and, and goes in, in communities and uh, in people's lives, and uh, it's, it's pretty common right now. People would rather hear a story than hear the truth. Yeah, I find it amazing what people will believe and not believe the Bible. Uh, God says that we need to be careful that we don't compromise. You know, most people are never confronted with the gospel truth and brought to conviction. You ever think about that? Most, most people have never had the plan of salvation presented to them. They've never had their sin exposed by God's Word. And that's what God's Word will do. It's a, it's a light. And it will, it will show them what's there. You know, most people are entertained and, and so on, but Bible preaching confronts sin. It doesn't tickle their ears. And then he says, be sober. In verse, verse 5, it's the word watch. Watch thou in all things. It's the same word in 1 Peter 5.8 when he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil. And what he's saying, it's kind of like, you know, in our day and age, we really discourage people from texting and driving. Right? Because they're not watching. You know, they're not being careful. They're not being sober. And people have died because, you know, someone's been careless like that. Now, that's the kind of thing he's saying to us. Don't get distracted. Keep your eyes on, on what the Lord is doing. Uh, be sober. In, in 1 Peter 1.13, he associates it, and I love this phrase, he associates it with gird up the loins of your mind. And that, that brings an interesting word picture. Uh, 1 Peter 1.13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that's to be brought unto you. you know, God wants us to be in control, uh, not be uh, careless, and, and not be... Um, uh, unmindful of, of the things that are going on around us. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. should be just a couple of pages back to your left there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He really gets into this subject of watching and being sober in 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 2, for instance, he says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as the thief in the night, 
For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with, with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We're not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Now, I'll stop reading there. You can see, man, he really hits on that subject, doesn't he? Watch. Jesus is coming. Uh, people need to know. Uh, watch because Jesus is coming, and watch because Satan is working. <laughs> you know, Satan's, Satan's busy. And, and if you take your eyes off of, uh, of what's going on, man, he'll have you. you know, like Jesus said to Peter, uh, Satan wants to grind... Grind you like, sift you like wheat, yeah. And uh, we, we watch expectantly, there in, in verse 2, yourselves know. You know God has told us there's things coming. Things are going to happen. Uh, he says we, we watch expectantly. We watch, you might say, illuminated. Verse, verse 5, uh, we're children of the light. You know, we're not in the darkness about this thing. Uh, we're to watch awake and sober, <laughs> not drunken. And out of control. He says, be sober. Then, in, uh, back in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and, and verse 5, not only says watch, but he says endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Earlier in the book, chapter 2, verse 3, he'd said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Some things in life are just tough. And, uh, you know, we just have to Trust the Lord and get through them. Uh, we have a book in our library. You'll get through this. And, and it's true. You know, if you give up, you give up too soon. You know, God, God will get you through. Uh, sometimes we have to endure affliction. Let me show you a real interesting verse. Hebrews 13, verse 23. This, this book was specifically directed to Timothy. And you might think, well, did Timothy, you know, he was a pastor. He, pastors have it easy. Hebrews 13, 23. I've never actually noticed this. I should have. I've read it. He says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly, I'll see you. Timothy spent some time in prison. It wasn't all easy for him as a pastor. And uh, Paul's warnings to him were right on the money. You know, he was going to have to endure hardness, endure affliction. And, and what do we do? What, what should we do when afflictions come? Well, James 5.13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That's the first thing to do. Take it to the Lord in, in prayer. Hebrews 12 talks about the afflictions of, of Jesus, and he says, look to Jesus. Let me read it to you. Hebrews 12, several verses here. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now for some people, that you know, it goes beyond that. But the people he was writing to, uh, they hadn't yet had persecution to blood. But you know, that, that comes in some countries where uh, affliction comes even to death. And uh, sometimes as Christians, we have to endure affliction. We have to watch, endure afflictions. Then he says, do the work of an evangelist. Now, I've, I've usually heard this preached that, oh, Timothy probably wasn't, you know, that probably wasn't his gift. It probably wasn't what he was best at. And he said, you know, make sure you do that. And that's probably true. I, I don't know. But you know, every Christian, you may not have the ministry of an evangelist. Uh, there's people who they, they travel and preach. You know, evangelists are different than a pastor. Uh, maybe they start, really, an evangelist goes and starts churches. Uh, we call them missionaries now. But, uh, or, and some people just have that personal ability, you know, to talk to people and, and persuade people. And, and you might think, well, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm not that way. But listen, you still have the responsibility to do the work of an evangelist. Even if you can't read. Man, we have so many helps today. Now you can hand them a tract. You know, you can, you can, you can take this thing and say, would you read this? 
on my phone, I have, I've got a way to witness to people. Now, it'd be better if it was bigger. But you can, you can, you can take a, I was going to say mechanical, whatever this thing is, and you can, you can work them right through it and show them all the verses. And Man, there's no excuse nowadays for not being, doing the work of an evangelist. Uh, we need to go beyond our, our comfort zone. Uh, it, you know, it's not always comfortable to talk to people about things that you think they might not like. But listen, if somebody gets saved, they're not going to give you a hard time for witnessing to them. <laughs> They'll thank you. Uh, Paul wrote, we preach Christ crucified. And what a message we have. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, he indicates that this is a trust that God has given to us. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Wow. And God has said, here, take this. I'm going to trust you with this. <laughs> That's what he's done with, with the gospel. He didn't ask angels to share the gospel. Maybe they'd have done it, you know. Wouldn't you love to just come in and when you came in, everybody falls on the ground. That's what happens in the Bible, you know. Uh, people don't fall on the ground when I knock on their doors. <laughs> they go like this. <laughs> Not always. Uh, but you know, God gave us. He trusted us with this message. That's a blessing. Now, I want you to note something here. This is very practical. In, uh, in verse, where are we? Verse 5. Do the, what's the next word? Work. Now, that's one of the few four-letter words that we like. No, we don't always like it. But you need to understand, evangelism is a work. It's not just a relaxing hobby. It's not just something that we do because it makes us feel better. It's a work. And uh, sometimes it's hard. I mean, I'm a pastor. And I'll tell you, it's, every time I go out, I think, oh, man, <laughs> going to go out again. <laughs> No, I shouldn't say that. I don't always do that. But it's the hardest thing to get started. And uh, God tells us, do the work of an evangelist. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, I won't say anything. I don't want to drive them away. Listen, they're already away. God's given us that, that trust to try and, and bring them to Him. And then the, the final thing, number nine there in uh, verse five, make full proof of thy ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Now, to fulfill your ministry, number one, you need to have a ministry. <laughs> All right? Uh, have a ministry. Thy ministry. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher. It just means you, you, there needs to be things you're doing for the Lord. I mean, you, you start off simple. You know, when, when a baby's born into a home, uh, you don't put them in charge of your business. <laughs> you know? Uh, you want them to learn how to eat. How to keep himself clean. You know, pretty simple things. And, if you're, you're a new Christian, learn how to read your Bible. And if when you learn something, share it with somebody. That's the best way to learn. Pray. Uh, share gospel tracts with people. Be faithful in church. And then as you begin to do those little things, God will give you more. You know, one of the kids asked me for something to do. and you know, It was hard to, to think of something just physical to do after, after the service, but we've had a few things that have, have come up. And you know, as you do one thing, that God, God says, man, he's faithful to that. I'll give him another one. And that's, the, that's the way it works. And uh, he says there, make full proof of thy ministry. Do it to the full. Don't you get tired of people who do things good enough? Oh, that's good enough. <laughs> I, I get so tired of the word potential. You know, all these kids around, you know, they all, man, they all got potential. And you, you hope that some of them will have potential for good, you know. Uh, it's not enough just to have potential. We need to do something. Do something for the Lord. And do it, do it well. Do it as best you can. Don't waste your life waiting for a calling. Volunteer. <laughs> you may not be the best at it. Uh, somebody has said the best ability is availability. You know, there's people who might do a better job, but they won't do it. Well, you do it. God will bless you instead of them. Uh, make full proof of your ministry. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to steer a moving car. And if you'll get moving, God will steer you. You might head in the wrong direction, but he'll help you. He'll get you going the right way. Uh, Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. You know, get busy doing the things, and, and God will even help your, your thoughts to, to be right. 
Uh, to have a ministry, it takes a servant. And uh, your ministry may not be the same as someone else's, but it's your ministry. Fulfill thy ministry. You know, a body needs many different parts, doesn't it? I was looking at my hand today, and I was thinking, I'm glad all my fingers aren't exactly the same. That'd look weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, if my thumb and all my fingers were exactly the same. You know, even things that are the same, their fingers, are different. And, and as Christians, we're different. Uh, we're not going to all be exactly the same. The, the main sameness is our Lord and, and His Word. And He, he hones us. He brings us uh, to what we need to be. Uh, he, he uses a very strong wording here. I charge thee, therefore, before God. Uh, take this to heart. He's saying, I solemnly witness this to you. This is important in, in your Christian life. What in the world are you doing for the Lord? <laughs> I mean, really, what in the world are you doing for the Lord? Uh, we need to do something. Uh, be faithful. Preach the word. Don't compromise. Watch. Endure. Evangelize. Fulfill your ministry. Ask God to, to use you and, and bless you. Remember your calling. Now, one of the key things of a calling as a Christian is you need to be a Christian. You know, do you know the Lord? Uh, if you died today, do you know according to God's word that you'd, you'd go to heaven? Have you responded to God's first call to salvation? That's the first call to answer. You know, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, you must be born again. Uh, respond to that call, and then uh, he'll take you by the hand. He'll, he'll lead you the rest of the way. But uh, uh, you need to be obedient to him. We're going to take our, our, our song books this evening and turn to page 518. Will Jesus find us watching? And as you think about this message tonight, not only take it to heart, but make whatever changes are necessary uh, for God to use you. you know, as God's word comes along, you'll think, oh, I can't do that because... Well, change that. Change it so God can use you. And if you can't change it, well, then God will use you in a different way. But page 518, will Jesus find us watching? I thought this would be a good song to end with tonight. Come on up.